Welcome to Harvest Christian Center. This is Pastor Mark. Today we'll be talking about living faith. When our faith begins to die, how do we grow that faith? How do we revive that faith? What are some of the things that we can do to have a living faith and not a dead faith? Thank you for being with us today. How many need God to do something in your life? <coughs> so here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to praise him on credit for what you need him to do. Give him the best praise of the morning right now. We thank you today, Father, for not all that you have done, not just for your son Jesus, not just for what he did on Calvary, he finished it there, but what is going to come to fruition in our lives, for what you are going to finish in our lives. We give you praise for the things that aren't done yet. We give you glory today. Anoint my lips to speak life to your people, Lord. God, I pray that you would use me in a special way today to touch the lives of your people. Let your sweet Holy Spirit do the work. Let me be the vessel that brings it. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 <laughs> Scripture says that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Throw me an apple. Please, Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Substance. That literally means it's something, right? It's tangible, but you can't see faith. You can't expect to see faith. And it's the substance of things hoped for. Now, Scripture tells us that every one of us that are born again child of God have a measure of faith. You were born with a measure of faith. But how many faith sometimes... <laughs> You feel like it's not enough. I'm the only one in the building, right? Because I tell you, sometimes my faith is weak. Sometimes I just struggle with believing. Two weeks ago, Jim prayed over me that the shingles were going to be gone. They were going to be set free and it was going to come quick. And believe me, the rash went away within a couple of days. But the pain of the crazy stuff just still happened. And I'm like, God, when is it right? And I want to believe that it will be gone today. Because I believe what you said was from God. I felt the Holy Ghost all over it. But sometimes my faith is weak. So this morning we're going to talk about growing faith or a living faith. We're going to talk about a living faith. And this is probably more of a teaching than a preaching. And I was asking the Lord this week if we could have one of those Holy Ghost hoedown services, right? Where everybody runs the aisles, everybody gets filled, everybody gets slain in the Spirit, everybody gets saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost. And he said, why don't we just do what I want to do? I said, oh, okay, we can do that, right? So this morning we're going to do it his way. If this touches your life, obviously you might run the aisles. But maybe it's something you want to meditate on. We're going to talk about living faith. Turn with me, if you will, to the book of James, chapter 2. No need to stand today for this reason. We're going to break it down as we go. Father, bless our time in the Word together in Jesus' name. So we're going to start with verse 1, and we're going to break down. We're going to talk about faith. Now, let me clarify something beforehand. James actually is believed to be the first book written of the New Testament. It was written around A.D. 45, somewhere between 44 and 46, around A.D. 45. So it's technically... The first book written before Paul wrote his letters and those type things, the book of James was written. So it's a good theology for us to look at because it was that. Now, we're not going to contradict any of what uh, Paul wrote. We're going to confirm what Paul wrote, but we're going to do this by God's word. So catch this with me. Verse 1. My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of God, with respect of person. Don't have the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now let me clarify this. We like to think of faith for salvation is one thing and faith for healing and deliverance and victory is another faith. But they're not. It's one faith. If you believe Christ is your Lord and Savior, you're supposed to have faith for the rest. But we've got to grow that faith sometimes. So here he is, James, and he starts out in chapter 2 and he says, My brethren, writing to the Jewish community in those days, he said, My brethren... Do not have the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ and put one man above another. If I think Tim Nichols is better than Tim Campbell, then woo, oh, <laughs> reality is this. If I have faith in Christ Jesus and yet I put some people above other people, then the reality is my faith is not the faith of Christ Jesus. My faith is not the faith 
faith of Christ Jesus, if I do that according to our beginning with verse 1, verse 2. For if there come unto you at your assembly a man with a gold ring in goodly apparel, and there come also a poor man in vile raiment, and you have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit under my footstool. He literally says this is a tax to faith. The way I treat people determines my faith in God. Now, we don't want to hear that, right? Because let's be honest, some folks don't, in my opinion, deserve as much, uh, as, and I'm not talking about financially, but some people have done me dirty over the years. And I don't always respect them with the same. But the scripture says, James begins by writing this. Remember, this is probably the first book written of the New Testament. And James writes and says this. If you're going to respect one person more than another, you don't have the same faith of Christ Jesus that you say you do. Now that's tough, right? So, we'll move on. Verse 4. And ye are not then partial in yourselves and are become judges of evil thoughts. Hearken, my brethren, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him. But you have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seat. Do not they blaspheme that, worth, that worthy name by which you are called. God calls the poor rich in faith. Chosen he calls them. When we put some above others it says we have a lack of faith. Now think about that. I don't think about that when there's faith. When I was studying this for this, my brain was racked because I don't consider my faith in God determined by how I treat others. But according to James, it says that the way I treat others is in direct link to my faith in God. If I don't treat others the way they ought to be treated, then my faith in God is weaker. Let me move on. Verse 8. If you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, now we're reading this verse for verse, line upon line, precept upon precept. If you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, you do well. But if you respect, if you have respected persons, you commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. So if I say I don't commit adultery, I don't kill, I'm serving God and I don't love my neighbor, he calls that the royal law. He says then my faith is weak because I cannot proclaim I have faith in God and a holy God and in what he says if I will not keep his royal commandments. So my faith is linked into keeping his commandments. Now, I know you may not have ever heard it that way. To be honest, I didn't either until this week. Never heard anybody preach it that way. But here's what he's beginning to show us. Let's move on. Verse 10. For whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now, if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So speak ye, and so do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. For he shall have judgment without mercy that have showed no mercy, and mercy rejoiceth, rejoiceth against judgment. He's literally saying you cannot pick and choose what part of the law to keep. Now we're not talking about the Old Testament law, we're talking about the law of God. The Ten Commandments that are found in the New Testament, by the way. We understand that we live under grace. It's a new covenant. But you can't pick and choose. So if we lived under Old Testament law, I can't say I've never committed adultery yet trim my beard. Because that was part of the Old Testament law. A man couldn't trim his beard. But under the New Testament law, under the law of grace of Christ, here's what he says. If I am truly going to have faith in God, then I have to literally obey what God has called me to do. Or my faith is not living, it's dead faith. Still with me? Yes. Still love me? Yes. All right. Verse 14. For what does it profit, profit my brethren, he's calling them his brethren, though a man say he has faith and have not works? Can faith save him? Now Paul writes to the Corinthians, we are saved through grace, through faith, that not of ourselves, but it's a gift of God, right? right. So Paul 
Paul says works has nothing to do with it. But here James is writing, and James says it like this. James says if you don't have works, you didn't have faith to begin with. Because faith produces works. Not works produces faith. You don't need works to be saved, but once you are truly saved, works come with it. And if you don't have works to go with it, the truth is you may have a dying faith, not a living faith. Because James writes to us and he says, faith without works is dead. Now we don't like that, right? Let me go on. Look at that. Just bear with me. Verse 15. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute, listen to the example he gives. If they don't have their daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, but notwithstanding you give them not to the things that are needful to the body, what does it profit? Even so faith, if it has not works, it's dead being alone. Now catch what he said. Now I'm not talking about the freeloaders. Believe me, we get the emails and the phone calls every week of the people that go from church to church stealing and proclaiming they need it. And the truth is that they're, they're freeloaders. They're, they're intentionally trying to steal from God's church. I'm not talking about those people. But what I'm talking about is this. Here's what he said. He said, your faith can be directly linked to this. If someone needs something and they are truly and genuinely in need and you can help them and you don't, your faith is exactly the same. It is useless without works. Now that's tough, right? I don't like that. Let me go on. Verse 18. I just read that. No, I didn't. Verse 18. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God and that does well, but the devil believes also and trembles. He says the devil has faith that there is a God, but he has nothing to back up his faith. Therefore, he knows it's real, but it doesn't apply because there are no works to back it up. Did you know that to the seven churches in the book of Revelation right before what we believe the rapture takes place, that he literally said to all seven churches, do you know what the first thing he said is? I know you by your works. I don't know you by the fact that you accepted me as Lord and Savior. I know you, the very first word to all seven churches is, I know you by what you do for me. Now think about it. And move on. I'm hurting. I know this is tough stuff. We're almost to the end of the chapter. Life's good. We got plenty of time. Verse 20. But wilt thou now, or wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? James says that we're not saved by faith. I believe that with everything in me. But I know this. Because I'm saved should produce works in me. Not to get me to heaven, but it should produce works in me. So James, if I can paraphrase what he's saying before we move on, He's saying, you know what? If your faith is struggling, you need to do more works for the kingdom of God. Because it will grow your faith. Huh? Let me move on. I'm going to read it to you straight out of the book. Verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac upon his son upon the altar? See how that faith wrought with his works, and by works his faith was made perfect. By his works, his faith was made perfect. You know what I think he said about Abraham right there? You can wallow and beg God till the day he, till, till the world ends, but if you don't get up and put some legs on your prayers like my mama said, there's no use in even praying the prayer. Now that's harsh, but let me, let me keep going. He said, Abraham, verse 23, and the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Abraham believed God. Abraham had a covenant with God. But when God said to Abraham, I want you to take the covenant that I gave you, Isaac, your only son Isaac, and I want you to take him up and sacrifice him on a mountain. 
The works that Abraham did was, he said, yes, Lord, I'll do exactly what you've called me to do, and I will do that, not because I have a covenant with you, not because I'm trying to prove my part of the covenant, but because I want to bless you and honor you in this covenant. My works are not to save me, they're because I'm saved. And the scripture says that Abraham's works were counted to righteousness. And God said, now I know I can trust you. Verse 25. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works. When she had received the messenger and had sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead... So faith without works is dead also. Now he says that more than once. Now the mouth of two or more witnesses, a thing is said more than once. We know that to be true. He gave us two examples. The second one is Rahab. Rahab said to the spies, we know that your God's going to destroy Jericho. We know that we have no hope whatsoever. We believe. Then the spies said to her, then do something about what you believe. Walk in the direction in which you believe God wants to go. Stop waiting on God to move before you move on His behalf. The works is what proves the righteousness of man before God. And you're saying, oh, you're talking about a works religion. You missed the whole point. You are saved through faith. But if you're ever going to grow your faith, here's what he said. Abraham's faith grew by being doing the works. Rahab's faith grew by doing the works. Let me just show you an example. Manny, where you at? Come here. He's nervous. That's all right. Jason was my guinea pig first service. So I'm going to make this as simple as we can. Okay? As simple as we can. Ready? You saved? You're born with a measure of faith. Born again with a measure of faith, right? But if there's no fruit, let's say you're an apple tree. You're rooted in good ground. But if you don't produce fruit, how do I know that you're a good tree? Hold that out over there. You're a tree. Hold this out over here. You're a tree. Now watch this. You want to grow your faith? For the tree to feed the apples, the fruit, it needs to draw more nutrients. You need to draw more. Your faith will be strengthened as you begin to produce fruit. You will become a stronger tree as you begin to produce fruit. You will begin to literally feed more. Now, we don't preach it this way because we don't want to upset anybody saying that they need to do something for the kingdom of God. But here is truth. Men and women that get saved and do nothing more often than not die by the wayside because they will not move forward for the kingdom of God. If you are constantly waiting on God for the next move, move in the direction. Watch this. Watch this. For him to feed the fruit, He's going to need to eat more faith, right? Yep. Open the mouth. <laughs> James is actually writing and saying this. James is <laughs> you can have that one. James is actually writing and saying this. That if you want to grow your faith, start working for the Lord. Start doing something on behalf of God. Because he said, without it, your faith will die. You don't have a living faith.
of the first books written for the New Testament, James says that if you have faith of the Lord Jesus Christ and you're doing nothing with it, it's dead faith. It's not real. <coughs> See, I can preach right here that you need to be teaching a class, you need to be doing this, you need to be doing that, but I'm not going to. Because here's the truth. If you want your faith to grow where you don't constantly live in fear and anxiety and stress and every other thing on planet Earth, start doing something. Amen. Whatever that is. Because faith <coughs> without work is dead. <coughs> James said, like a tree, when you begin to produce fruit, when you begin to lead people to Jesus, your faith is going to grow. When you see that first piece of fruit, you're going to want more. And in order to do so, you're going to draw. And you're going to begin to draw more. And that measure of faith is going to be bigger. And it's going to be stronger. And it's going to be more and more. And then the depression is going to have to leave because the faith is stronger than the depression. And then God's going to begin. To, and you're saying, you mean I'm working for God? I never said that. I said if you want to grow your faith, do more for the kingdom of God. If you think I get up here every Sunday morning giddy and excited and I'm all ready to go, I can tell you, you missed the boat. Because the preacher said it one time, I'm 60% sure I'm doing the right thing. Ha! 60%? That was a failing grade when we went to school. You didn't get a 70, you didn't win. You want to sit down? You should go How about a little hanging fruit? That was <laughs>
faith, isn't it? See, here's what I'm talking about. The works come with the faith. Before God heals, i got to believe He's going to heal. Before God delivers, i got to believe He's got to deliver. Before I see God move in my church, we can cry, we want revival, we can have 18,000 meetings a year, but the truth is, until we move in the direction of revival in our hearts and in our bodies and in our minds, we're never going to see God move in revival. If you want to see the dead raised, start praying for the dead to be raised. I know this isn't a shout message, is it? This isn't like storm the altar. You know why it's not? Because some days that's all I want is God to fix it for me. And I am so happy when he does. And I love those moments. I hope next week it is so crazy in here that you can't breathe because the Spirit of God is so thick. But I also thank God when he teaches me. And today's about teaching us. And here's what James said. Your faith's a lot like a tree. If it doesn't produce fruit, it's going to die. So get busy producing fruit. And as you do, you'll begin to feed your own spirit. You'll begin to feed your own mind. Can I rattle on for a minute more? I went through an ugly time in my life. Ugly. Homeless, lost everything. Literally lost everything I had. Was living in the back seat of a truck that wasn't mine. And a friend of mine came up and grabbed me and said, Get, go. What do you mean? It's raining, it's dark, it's damp, you need to go. Because if not, you're going to end up putting a bullet in your head because depression is going to destroy you. You're feeding the depression. You're feeding it. Your mind is focused on it. You meditate on it. Focus on something else. Force yourself to move forward. Force yourself. Well, I'm waiting for God to deliver me and set me free. He did that on Calvary. Now move. Because the truth is, if I don't feed my faith, it's not a living faith. It's a dead faith. And the more I grow it, the more I'll produce. Do you know that God said to all seven churches, the number of completion, He said, I will know you by your works. He didn't say, I'll know you because you accepted me and believed. He said, I'll know you by the fruit you produce. The only way I can know Him is to be saved, accept Him, which is a free gift. The only way he'll know that I'm serious about that is if I do something with it. So this morning, here's what I want to ask you to do. Let me have that one. Give him a hand. I had these great big Fuji apples I was going to bring from home and forgot them. So you got little cheap apples. Sorry. <laughs> if you need God to move why don't you at least take one step forward today and say God I need you to move on this I'm taking a step in that direction I'm trusting you I'm believing you to move on my behalf <coughs> I know it's literally just walking from the front to the back but I'm willing to do something to show you that I'm serious Wednesday night is going to be a lot of fun. A lot of fun. God, I just want to move because of what you did for me. I'm not looking for you to do anything else. If you do, glory. But I'm going to move in the direction of the next thing. I'm going to prepare for the abundance of rain you're going to pour out. I'm going to start prepping. With everything I do, my works are going to be so evident that no one can deny my relationship with Christ. Because he said that if I need my faith to not be dying, I need to move forward in a living faith. You need a bigger faith to 
knock out the fear, to knock out the stress. How about you need God to heal the financial woes in your life? Start moving in that direction. How do you do that? Stop spending all your money and start doing it the way God says. Then he'll do the rest. You need God to heal the diabetes? Back off the pie. Take a step forward and watch what he will do. You need your children saved? You need to get rid of fear and anxiety? You need to grow your faith. And James said, a growing faith has works. And the more I study this, the more I realize, the more I do, the more my faith is strengthened. And all of a sudden, when I couldn't pray through a common cold, I'm laying hands on the dead and watching them get up. Because I grew my faith through my works along the way. Father, I don't know what else to say, so I'm going to stop. I'll turn it over to your sweet Holy Spirit. I know there are people here that needed to hear this or you wouldn't have said it. Myself included. I pray that you stir our hearts to grow our faith. Move in the direction that you're going and see what you do. With Abraham, you counted it righteousness. With Rahab, you saved her whole family. With the apple tree, you strengthened it from the trunk up. God, I'm praying that you grow our faith as we move forward for you. That we might win this city for the kingdom of God. Stand with me if you will. Thank you so much for being with us today. I pray that the Lord touched your life through the sermon today and that you grow your faith and it becomes a living faith that produces fruit in everything that you do. So Pastor Mark, thank you again. We'll see you next week.